Uh, this morning I want to talk to you on the subject of the coming universal health care program. Since nobody has said anything about that in a long time, I thought maybe I'd say something about it. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and uh, verse 10, you need not turn there, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not a root of all evil. It is the root of all evil, the love of money. Now, you don't have to be rich to love money. Many rich people really don't love money, and many poor people love money. So it's not a sin uh, to be rich, and it is not a virtue to be poor. I mean, you can have wicked people in all levels, can't you? Okay. But the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. And uh, the goal of socialism and communism is and always has been to take profit from business and to grab it, grab the business and the profit for itself. Now this is the goal of many in our government and in any government in fact. It's not just this government, it's any government. And uh, the goal, of course, uh, the major, one of the major steps that's going on today is the socialization of medical care. And I'm not going to preach on that today, but you need to hear all this stuff. Uh, the goal uh, is for the government to take over all doctors and uh, medicines and hospitals. And uh, once that is in place, uh, you can expect to see the kind of health care program eventually that you have in any socialist and communist country, like in the Soviet Union, which was pure communism, and in Cuba. I mean, that, they've got real communism there, right? That's the end result. Now, Canada has had socialized medicine for many years. And if you think that their health care is superior, why do you suppose most of their citizens come to the U.S. for heart surgeries? You think about it for a while. Now, that's neither here nor there, but I just wanted to get that off my chest because I've got a, got a platform, so sometimes you need to say what you need to say. But now the real problem in, in government or in the world is a matter of greed. It doesn't matter where it's at. Greed is in every, every profession. It doesn't make any difference. If you live uh, on a block where they've got two families, one of them is, is greedy, I guarantee you. Uh, it just It's there. And you are not going to rid this world of sin. And you're not going to rid the world of greed. And uh, certainly there is, a man has a, a need uh, for health care. Matter of fact, he, he, needs, he doesn't have, need health care, he needs health. And, uh, and so the problem is too complex uh, for man to ever solve it. It never has been solved, and, it, and, and, it's, and I'm not a prophet of doom, but it's not going to be solved by man. Right. It's going to be solved by Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, the, the reason, uh, the devil, what the devil does is he sees a need and he capitalizes on it, exploits it. And uh, there is a need, and the need for some kind of, uh, of universal health is because uh, of uh, Adam's sin. Sickness is here, it's very real. In fact, I never realized how good I felt until the other day I got sick. Uh, Monday evening, I went home and, uh, and uh, got some, uh, you know, being the homemaker I am, I went over to the cupboard and I got a can of, uh, of uh, beef stew and I labored over electric can opener and I opened it and I put it in a bowl, are you impressed? Put it in a bowl and I put it in a microwave. I mean, man, where have the women gone? I mean, you see, and I put it in there and I nuked it and I ate that, and I went over to the refrigerator and got a big slice of uh, meatloaf, which I don't like, but I was hungry. So I got some meatloaf, and uh, I sat down, and I ate at about 11 o'clock at night a bowl of, uh, of that uh, beef soup and a slice of meatloaf. And I got a little ketchup and Tabasco sauce because you got to liven that stuff up. you got to resurrect it, especially meatloaf. And uh, so I ate that. And I felt pretty good. And the next morning when I woke up, I was sick as a horse. I mean, I was sick. And um, I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't feel like I have the flu. I think, uh, I think, I think that stuff was poison. She kind of grinned and said, you're catching on. You say, it was the meatloaf. 
kind of like the guy, the two fellows, they uh, helped me get back to this later. But uh, these two, two buddies, they hadn't seen each other in a long time. And they met and they started talking and they finally got around to the wife and kids. And this guy said, uh, how's your wife? And he says, well, he said, my wife, I sad to say, is dead. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What happened to her? And he said, well, she ate some poison mushrooms. And, but he said, uh, I'm remarried and, uh, and uh, have a family. And he said, well, how's you know, the new wife? And he says, well, she's in the hospital. And he said, oh, what's wrong with her? And he said, well, she wouldn't eat her mushrooms. <laughs> that's the best I can do. I guess that's been around a while. Anyway, anyway, so, man, I was sick. I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I don't feel like I have the flu. I feel like I've been poisoned or something. And uh, eventually the unfortunate happened, and, and uh, nature took care of it. Uh, and I began to, you know, vomit and all that kind of stuff. And then I felt, I felt better. And I came to work, but I didn't feel like working, which I seldom do. But I came to work. And I, you know, I kind of hung around here for a little while Tuesday afternoon, but I just couldn't get with it. And my secretary said, Preacher, you don't look good. And uh, so I went, uh, went home a little bit early, and all day uh, Wednesday, I, man, I felt bad. And, um, but, you know, the next day, it was like a resurrection. I felt great. And I told uh, my wife, I said, you know, I didn't know how sick I was until I saw how good I feel now, you see. And uh, now she's sick. As a matter of fact, I don't even th I don't think she's here. Uh, she's, you know, <laughs> I got even with her. <laughs> now, really, she was she's sick all yesterday and last night and all day today. So she was going to try to make it for the 11 o'clock hour, but but she's sick with the same stuff, I guess, the same meatloaf. <laughs> but anyway, you know, uh, sin or sickness is uh, is uh, and disease is here. Well, you don't need any proof of that. But we might ask the question, why is it here, and where does it come from, and why is it we can't get rid of it? I mean, we've, if we've been evolving for 32 million years, you'd think we'd make a little progress, wouldn't you? But death is still total, and uh, it seems like every time you cure one thing, five things pop up in its place, you see. And uh, we have plagues today, not the same ones, but the same kind of thing. And the, and the problem is that sin and disease is a result, or sickness and disease is a result of Adam's sin. And not only that, ladies and gentlemen, sickness is God's reminder uh, to you and me how finite we are. Uh, God uses it to humble us. All through the Bible, God used sickness to humble people. He uses it to humble us. And when you get sick, you realize just how frail you are. And uh, God allows it to keep us humble and, and to bring us to prayer. The Apostle Paul had some kind of affliction. I'm not sure what it was. But he called it a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed about it three times for God to take it away. And the Lord wouldn't remove it. And, uh, he, and he, Paul said that this was, this was given to him to humble him, lest he be exalted above measure. And you know, some of you, you're, you struggle with something all of your life. Maybe something, a birth defect, or maybe some kind of a, something you inherited from your parents, or, or some kind of, of, of infirmity that all of your life. You know, you might turn that around and, 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 and put God into the equation and realize that maybe God is trying to, to keep, get your attention and to keep you praying and to remind you that you're just flesh. See? Um, you know, rather than looking at it as some kind of uh, a demonic affliction or God's judgment, it may not be that at all. It may be the very thing you need. You know, I, I don't wish bad luck on anybody. But you know what I've watched over the years? That some of these ladies, and men, but usually it's the ladies, uh, that their husbands have abandoned them or they've, uh, you know, the husbands have run off and left them and they've been left to raise the kids. But you know what I've, I've watched a lot of those women? A lot of those women um, are, are women who will say, would you pray for me? And they'll be praying in their, in their situation and, and seeking God's guidance and God's help. Now, again, I'm not going to play God. But I, we wonder sometimes, would we be asking people to pray for us and would we be seeking God's uh, God's help, and would we be constant? Would we be reminded of God uh, if everything went well? 
God knows what you and I need. God knows the kind of thing to bring into our life to humble us and to keep us before Him. And it takes different things for different people, you see, and different times. But sickness is a reminder that you and I are sinners and that we are finite and that God uses these things to humble us. And then, of course, sickness is sometimes the result of our own uh, behavior. Sometimes we bring things on ourselves, but nevertheless, they're here. And in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5, the writer says, Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt, referring to the nation of Israel, and of course that would be true of any nation. You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. But the question was, why will you revolt? And in this situation here, the, uh, the, the sickness and everything was a judgment of God upon the nation because of their wickedness. And um, God still uh, judges nations because of, uh, of their wickedness, and he uses, uh, he uses plagues and disease and pestilence to do that. Now, the problem is man can't, he can't rid the world of these things. Uh, no matter how hard we try, you'll find that most of the things that we use to try to heal a particular uh, ailment has all kinds of side effects. I had cancer. You know, I don't mess around with little, little things, you know. You're just going to have something, you might as well have something big. So uh, I had cancer of the colon and uh, had a foot and a half of my colon taken out. And, uh, and then they took a needle about this long, something like that, about that big around, full of liquid radium. And uh, they took that and they shot it into my veins. I glowed for about six months after that, but they shot that stuff in there. And my doctor said, well, I don't know, maybe your hair will fall out or, uh, you know, we don't know. And, uh, you know, you may be sick at your stomach for a long time. We don't know. But I didn't have any major side effects like that. But something did happen to me in my system that I will uh, never get over and uh, it'll be with me till I die. And, uh, and it's a result, according to Dave and Cheryl Wood, my uh, doctors that I had talked to at one time, uh, some of the problems are the result of that medication. So sometimes when they give you something to fix a problem, it'll, it'll start another problem, creates another problem. So, you know, we thank God for what we call progress, whatever that is, but it's not always without a cost. Now, God made a promise here in the Old Testament, and will you turn to Isaiah 35 in the same book? And the Lord promised that there would be a world without sickness. And, uh, <clears throat> and also, would you turn to keep that place and turn to Exodus 23? Exodus 23. Now, it's important that you understand uh, this matter of uh, sickness and disease and how God is going to deal with it. Uh, in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 25, God said to the nation of Israel, And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. Now watch what it says. And I will take sicknesses away from the midst of thee. I will take it away from you. Probably if you ran a cross-reference on that, you would find that God told them also that if they would obey him, he said, I won't put any of the sicknesses or the diseases of Egypt upon you. Now listen, what God was trying to do at that point was to have a representative nation, the nation of Israel, a nation that had a perfect health care program. And their health care program would be God himself. And if they would obey God and follow God, they would be a peculiar people to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world would look to Israel as a holy nation, as a peculiar people, as a blessed people. And the rest of the nation would look to Israel and see those blessings, that those blessings came from their God. And the rest of the world would be attracted to this holy God, a, 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 a righteous, solitary God, rather than uh, wickedness and lewdness and idolatry and, and a multitude of gods. So he said when he brought them out of Egypt, he said, I'll put you in a good land, I'll be your God, I'll build a wall around you, I'll protect you, and I'll take sickness away from you. Now you can read in other places to where he told them very clearly that, uh, that uh, 
they would not have any miss, uh, miss births when they're animals and, and uh, when their animals would uh, have their young there would be no miscarriages. In other words, it was going to be like a heaven on earth. Did you ever understand, did you ever think about this prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Now if the Soviet Union or any other foreign country conquered the United States, the first order of business would be to set their government up on your shores, right? right. Their government would be here. And their, you would learn and you would obey their doctrine. So if Israel as a nation would in their heart obey God, God's kingdom would have come from heaven and God's kingdom would have been established on the earth. Our Father which art in heaven. You know folks pray that this morning all across the world men and women have stood like a bunch of mannequins and repeated that prayer and had absolutely no idea what they were saying. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory and forever and ever. Amen, 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 amen. And they say that prayer and have absolutely no idea what they're saying. That is a prayer that Israel was to pray for the literal, visible, millennial reign of God or Jesus Christ on this planet. That's what that prayer is all about. And in the tribulation, the Jews are going to pray that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Why, you haven't prayed that prayer since you've been saved. Give us this day our daily bread. You don't, you don't pray that prayer. If you did, you don't believe it. You probably have never had to pray that prayer. Well, you still got a credit card. You don't need to pray that prayer. You don't pray that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. I guarantee you, if you're in the tribulation in Israel, during the seven-year tribulation, you'll pray that prayer. That's what they were praying in the time of Gideon. Remember Gideon when he was down there in the little wine press trying to beat out some wheat so he could make a piece of bread? Remember the woman that Elisha went to and she was gathering some sticks so she could fix the last handful of meal and feed her son so they could die? Now, if she prayed that prayer, it means something. Give us this day our daily bread. And if you were in India, somewhere in India in some parts of this world, and you had to pray that prayer, it might make sense. But that doesn't make any sense in America. And doctrinally, it doesn't have anything to do with you anyway. It's... Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When that prayer is answered, you're not even going to be on the earth. When that prayer is answered, you're going to be in heaven. Now, <clears throat> so then God said to the nation of Israel, I want you to be a kingdom of priests and a peculiar people. And I will bless you and use you and take away your sicknesses and your diseases. Now let's go a step further. Let's go to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, verse 1. Now I want you to see in 35, 1 that it's talking about the kingdom. It's not talking about Linwood, Washington. It's not talking about Death Valley, California. No, now uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 35... And verse 1, Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and let all that is therein, the world and all things that are come forth of it. Well, that's wrong. That's a nice verse, a nice chapter, but it's a wrong chapter. <laughs> I was about to wax eloquent there. Didn't even know what I was reading. <laughs> chapter 35 will do. The wilderness. I've been sick. <laughs> Chapter 35, watch it now. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. You think Lebanon has seen it? Not yet. Why, Lebanon's a mess. It wouldn't be safe for you to walk down the streets of Lebanon, would it? Of course not. But Lebanon's going to see something. Lebanon's just north. You know where it's at. 
And Leaven is going to see it. Notice what it says. They will see the excellency of our God. What are they going to see? Look at verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even with a God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Watch what will happen, verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Now there you have, there you have a promise and just one of hundreds of promises in the Old Testament. God told Israel when he brought them out of Egypt that if you will obey me as a nation and follow me and be righteous as you just read in Isaiah chapter 1, if he will rend your heart and not your clothes. Did you notice in Isaiah chapter 1 God said, I'm fed up with sacrifices? God said, I don't want any animal sacrifices. I don't want your new moons and your Sabbaths and your holy days. That's in Isaiah 1. God said, I'm fed up with burnt offerings. I have no pleasure in those things. I don't want form. I want substance. See? God wanted a nation that would be righteous in their heart. And by doing so, God said, I will make an example to you to all the world. And you will be the glory of the world. And I will take away all sickness and disease from you. But they didn't repent. So God scattered them. But in Isaiah, while they're being scattered, Isaiah is prophesying that the promise of God that he made back there in, 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 the, in the beginning is still going to be fulfilled. Now, let's notice, if you will, in Matthew 11, in Matthew 11, how that that provision was made. In Matthew chapter 11. And by the way, and when this takes place, there won't be any deaf ministry in any church because there won't be any deaf. And there won't be any shut-in ministry because there won't be any shut-ins. There won't be any crippled people. There won't be any sick people. Let's go to Matthew 11. Now, in Matthew 11, the ministry of John the Baptist has been going on for a few months. Listen to me. John has been arrested. John the Baptist now has been thrown in prison. Well, John's been preaching for these many months saying, Get ready, the king is coming, the kingdom is near. The kingdom that was prophesied there in Isaiah where the, the, there will be streams in the desert and the Lebanon will see the glory of God and the, and the blind will be able to see and the deaf will be able to hear and the lame will be able to walk. And so John now has been preaching this, but now he's in prison. He hears through the grapevine about Jesus Christ and he sends a message and he says, are you the one that we should be looking for or should we look for somebody else? Look at the, uh, chapter 10 here in Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 11. Uh, 10, let's see, 10. Uh, no, I want 11. Look at 11 verse, uh, verse 2. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and he said, Art thou he that should come or do we look for another? This is John the Baptist who's been preaching. Jesus answered and said unto him, he said, you go show John the things which you do hear and see. Now, you notice he didn't say to John, yes, I'm him. Everything's okay, John. Just hang in there. He didn't say that at all. You know what he did? He quoted that text in Isaiah 35. The one you just read in Isaiah 35 about the kingdom, about the streams in the desert, about the blind, the lame, the halt, and so on. He quoted that text. He didn't say, yeah, I'm the Messiah. He said, you go tell John the things you see and hear. Look at verse 5. The blind receive their sight. That's a direct quote from Isaiah 35. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now what is happening right here in the ministry of Jesus Christ is that he is offering not only righteousness to the nation of Israel and that, that supreme place that God promised them in the Old Testament, but he is promising them a universal health care program to where sickness and disease is going to be removed. The, the blind will get their sight. And by the way, that's not spiritually blind. That's, right, that's, right. that's folks who are literally blind. And the, most, and the most humorous thing, the, most, the comical thing going on today is some fellow in a faith healing meeting trying to pretend to heal people. Right. It's a joke. Right. Well, matter of fact, if you think I'm being a little bit out of line here, let me just throw you a challenge. I'll give you a challenge. Would you give me the name and address of any person 
who was legally blind and went to a faith healer and through a miraculous healing he got his sight back. If you give me his name and address I'll have him to come and give the testimony. You want to do it? You want to find me a person who was medically deaf, couldn't hear, and went to a faith healer and got his healing back, got his hearing back? Give me the name and address. I'll have him to come give testimony. You know somebody that was, was dead? Lazarus was dead four days. You want to find somebody that was dead and that a faith healer raised him from the dead? Give me the name and address. I'd love to see him. Get a little quiet in here. For instance, you want to find one AIDS patient that went to a faith healer and was healed of AIDS? Just give me one. You know one? Give me the name and address. Leprosy is a horrible disease. They have an island in Hawaii where they send lepers. You want to find me one person healed of leprosy by a faith healer? Huh? Preach it. In fact, retardation, you can't fake that. Right. Some of you try. <laughs> you want to find me one person that was retarded that got in a healing line that got healed? You know why these fellows can't produce these miracles? Because they were kingdom miracles that God, that Jesus Christ gave to his apostles. That's right. And they were associated with the kingdom of Israel, a kingdom on this earth where there would be no disease and no sickness and no death. And the confusion in Christendom today is that God's people and preachers in particular will not make a distinction between the ministry to the body of Christ today and the kingdom ministry of Jesus Christ. They just mix it all together and stir it up in a pot and God's people are so confused they don't know what's going on. So they're trying to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're trying to speak in tongues. They're trying to raise the dead. And in doing it all, you know what they're raising? They're raising the devil. Right. Amen, amen, amen. He said, I don't like you. That's okay. You don't have to like me. Just bring those people so I can talk to them. I know what I'm talking about. I wasn't born yesterday. In fact, I sat for four hours in my office with a carpet man who's a, who, with a fellow who's, and he's my friend. We, we, I loaned him 25 chairs. He's, he's Assembly of God, started a church. I loaned him, we loaned, I loaned him 25 chairs uh, about 17 years ago so he could get a work started. I wouldn't tell you his name if, if, if you guessed it. So he's not my enemy. He's my friend. But I, laid that I opened this text to Matthew 11 and laid this challenge on him. And I said, if you'll bring me one person that fits that description of a miracle in six months, I'll apologize to you. Hey, that's been 15 years. He can't bring one. It's interesting that a charismatic church has the largest deaf ministry in Seattle. Did you hear me? That a charismatic church has the largest deaf ministry in Seattle? Are you out there? I tell you, a real joke is a, is a wheelchair ramp going up to a Pentecostal church. Yeah, that's right. This matter of the kingdom ministry and, uh, and this idea of success, of prosperity theology is so confusing God's people that they're not sure where they're supposed to be. Right. Well, would you turn to Matthew 10? Back up there just a little bit. Matthew 10. <clears throat> Matthew 10. Watch this. And when he had called unto him his what? Twelve. His twelve. Now it doesn't say thirteen or twenty-four, it's twelve. And these are the twelve disciples of the twelve apostles. Right. And they're not preachers today, there's those twelve apostles. And he called them and he gave them what? Power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness. There it is. They had the power to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. This universal health that the Bible teaches will be, uh, will be available and present when Jesus Christ rules on this earth in the power uh, of his kingdom. You'll notice down in verse 5, Then these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Well, look at that. You Gentiles aren't, aren't even included in this ministry. Right. The Gentiles aren't even included in this ministry at this time. Go not to the Gentiles or any Samaritan, enter not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you preach, say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. He said, you preach that it's at hand. It isn't here, but it's at hand. Heal the sick. Look at verse 8. Heal the sick. 
Notice what it says. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. And don't make any charge for your ministry. See that? Don't you understand that's kingdom ministry? That doesn't have anything. That, that ministry is 2,000 years back there. And so God offered to the nation of Israel that very thing that He promised them back there at the very beginning of my message. I mentioned it. God said to Israel when He brought them out of Egypt as a nation, If you will obey me, I'll be your God. I'll heal your diseases. I'll put away sickness from you. You will prosper. You will be the glory of the nations. But they didn't repent. So He scattered them. But He raised up prophets and said, I'm going to offer it again. And when Christ came, he offered it again, and they rejected it. But it ain't over. It ain't over. God will still keep his promise to the nation of Israel. But since Israel has been set aside temporarily in the book of Acts, God saved a little Jew named Paul. He was not one of the twelve, nor was he the thirteenth one. He was one by himself. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. Well, if he was an apostle to the Gentiles, who were the other 12 to? What, to the Jews only? Okay. So he was one. He had a new message, a different message. And that message is to all the world. And by the way, it is this. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He paid for your sins. And God has made no difference in this day between the Jew and the Gentile. The prisoner or the prison keeper, the male or the female, the king or the slave, God has made no difference. No difference as far as salvation is concerned. Salvation, the wall has been broken down, and any man, woman, boy, or girl who wants to be saved doesn't have to become a Jew. He doesn't have to go to Jerusalem. He doesn't have to keep the Sabbath. He doesn't have to be baptized. He doesn't have to be circumcised. He doesn't have to do anything other than accept Jesus Christ as his substitute as his Savior. That's a free gospel to everybody. But he didn't tack on to it all of the kingdom promises of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and raising the dead and prosperity theology. He didn't give that to you and me. Don't you know, ladies and gentlemen, don't you know, don't you know that if there was a healer in this world who had the gift of healing, he would heal one genuine AIDS patient and that would be publicized around this planet. And don't you know the world would be seeking to genuine healers if it was real? Don't you know that? You watch too much television. That's your problem. You're watching too much television. And by the way, if you just shut that thing off and read your Bible, you'd wake up. Say, I'm not mad at you. I love you and I'm just going to rattle your cage if I can to get your attention. I'm not mad at you. But some of you need to wake up and, and smell and know what's going on. You say, now, I'm not saying these folks aren't saved. I haven't even said that. Say, I don't, I don't believe that. I think that. I think most many of them are born again people. And I believe they love Christ. Say, but by the way, being saved and loving Christ doesn't guard you from deception. Right. The only guard from deception is this book. Right. This is it. And just because you feel good doesn't mean you are good. Amen? Amen. And because you feel bad doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean anything. But we've got a generation of people that go on their feelings. We've got a president. That's all it is. Talk about, well, I just want you to know I feel how you feel. <laughs> and by the way, folks like it that way. Yeah. Because we've got a... Now then, would you turn with me to Psalm 8? I've got just a couple more things I want to show you. What I've said to you, number one, is the need for health care and healing and deliverance from diseases is obvious because of Adam's sin and our sins. There was a promise made both uh, made to Israel, it's not made to the Gentiles. It was made there in Exodus 23, 25 and also uh, Isaiah 35. The provision was made when Jesus Christ came and uh, not only himself demonstrated the power of the kingdom ministry, but he delegated this power uh, to his 12 disciples. But the time is going to come, even though Israel as a nation rejected Christ and this offer of the kingdom of righteousness, and Israel has been temporarily set aside. And I use the word temporarily because God's not through with the Jews. 
I'm telling you, God's not through with the Jews. And Israel right now is going back to their nation in unbelief. But they're going back. And you're going to see a mass exodus from the United States in the next few years of the Jews. But before the Jews will leave America, they have to be persecuted. You hear me? Right. Jews will not leave any country where they are until they're persecuted. So what God does is He brings persecution on the Jew to send him home. So what you're going to watch in America is you're going to watch more anti-Semitism. You're going to see it more and more. And God is going to raise up a people. They're not godly people, but He'll raise up a people. And their primary target will be the Jews. And there will be such persecution and different things on the Jews that the Jews will go home. But now when a Jew goes home, guess what he takes with him? <laughs> he takes his money. He always takes his money when he goes home. And when a Jew leaves America, when all the Jews leave America and take their money, guess what you've got? <laughs> you think you're broke now? You ain't seen nothing. You say, is it going to happen? As sure as I'm standing here, it's going to happen. God's going to send them back home. And then the Jewish nation is going to be there in unbelief as it is today. As it is today. And then the nations of the world are going to go against them in their own land. And that's where the battle of Armageddon comes on the scene. And the Antichrist and the whole name of the game. And, that's, and by the way, it all started over there. It all ends over there. Now then, look at Psalm 8 and you'll see part of the realization of this. Psalm 8 and verse 3. Psalm 8, look at verse 3. <clears throat> In Psalm 8, verse 3, When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him, man, to have dominion over the works of thy hands. That's what you saw in when God created Adam. And that was God's plan for Israel as a nation. Thou hast dominion over thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and beasts of the field and fowls of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the sea. Uh, o Lord, our Lord, how excellent uh, is thy name in all the earth. Now that is an anticipation of the realization of the kingdom on the earth. Now if you'll go to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 2. When Jesus Christ came, he accomplished at the cross everything that was necessary for this kingdom to become a realization for Israel. But they rejected it. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5. Hebrews 2 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. That's that kingdom I was telling you about. Whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified saying, quote, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou hast visited him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Thou didst set him over the works of thine hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection to his feet. For in that he put all in subjection unto him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That includes disease. But watch this. But now, ladies and gentlemen, but now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Now did you get that? He said that everything has been taken care of as far as the blood of Christ is concerned in redemption. And he quotes that psalm in Psalm 8. And he says there is nothing that has not been put under subjection to him, including disease and death and sickness. But now, during this 2000 period here, but now we see not all things put under him, but we will in the millennium. What do we see now? By faith we see Jesus Christ, the one who died for you. Now, <clears throat> Peter tells us that God is not slack concerning his, his promise, but that all men should come to repentance. So we see Jesus Christ, and he died for every man. Today we walk by faith in the resurrected Christ. Now the last thing is this matter of requirements. The requirements to participate in this free universal health care program, one is to acknowledge your sickness. In Isaiah 1.5, Isaiah said, why should you be sick anymore? 
you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot to the top of the head there is no soundness, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed nor bound up nor mollified with ointment. Now will you turn last of all to Revelation 21. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Now listen, because Israel was wicked, God couldn't dwell with them. You read in the book of Ezekiel that God left them. The glory of the Lord departed. Now when Jesus Christ came, he came to the temple. Now, if you know anything about the future ministry of Jesus Christ, it's centered around the temple. He will be a high priest and a king at the temple in Jerusalem. So he came to Jerusalem to the temple. But when he got there, they were selling doves and sacrifices, and they turned the house of God, the, the temple, into a house of merchandise. And he overthrew their tables, and here's what he said to them. Your house is left unto you desolate. And he went out. Now you know what you had right then? You had the glory of God once again departing from the temple. And he said, you will not see me again until you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now here in Revelation, it says that he dwells with them.